Ladies and, gentlemen, my, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to present to you our next very distinguished guest, who for quite a while now has been an excellent source for information on artists, arts around the world of all sorts, categories and variations. I'm very proud to present to you Regine Debati. So, yes, I'm Régine Debati and I'm a blogger. Most of the time I, I write on a blog called We Make Money Not Art about what artists are doing with technology. So I will explain it a bit later. And I just start with a warning, is that if you had a look at the program online and at my extract, uh, I will not talk about that. I changed my plan at the last minute. I was supposed to talk about how artists are dealing with surveillance society and CCTV camera, and then I thought, no, it will be too much like what I did last year with UC, and I don't want to repeat it, even if I give another context, if I, even if I give other examples. And then, uh, and then UC is not there, so it will be less cool anyway. He's in Finland skiing or whatever. Um, so I changed the topic, and, and so two days ago I thought, yeah, what I'm going to, to talk about, I don't know, and I had these very not smart ideas, which was, why not follow the, um, the, the theme of, of the conference, which is about trust, like um, Tim said yesterday, our society is in need of trust, but should we trust anyone? So the, the kind of project I'm going to explore now, um, project by artists who um, explore this notion of trust or more, more the contrary of it. So I will show example of people or kind of people or societies, organizations which we shouldn't trust and which are not the one you would expect when you think about not trusting someone or something. But first of all, I'm not sure how many of you really are familiar with new media art, so I thought I would start very quickly and very, by a very dirty and super fast introduction to new media art as I, as I see it myself. Um, something more about, about me is that um, I started, I have no background in art nor technology. I started blogging in March 2004. Uh, I just discovered that there was these people um, doing things they were not supposed to do with technology. You mean, I mean, these artists, they, are, they have something in common with, with hackers, is that they get the user manual of um, technology and they are just not happy with it. They just immediately th see the limits and, and want to do other things and go beyond the kind of stuff they are supposed to do. So I started this blog and it was kind of documenting what my finding because I knew nothing but I was interested. I had loads of time at the office because I had a very boring job. And I'm still two years and a half after that. I'm still not an expert. I still have lots of things to learn. But I learned a few things such as um, these new media artists, these people um, playing around with technology, uh, they are not just fun or poetical, they can they also, I think, have a role very important and crucial in society, and I'm going to show three kind of roles they could, they could play. And then I will talk about these trust projects, but first, my very quick introduction. With a project that I guess some of you know, because it's been developed by, by a company of artists and interaction designers based in Berlin, it's called TerraVision. It's an installation um, which wa was developed around in 94. And um, so you're in front of a globe and you can navigate the globe and, and go from one part of the earth to the other. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can overlay some other information like, like weather or pollution. You can zoom and uh, trigger like on Potsdamer Place and trigger a video uh, shoot it decades ago. And it's very, it's, um, I mean, it can be very precise and give good images, but it depends on, on the, the resolution of the satellite images it gets. So sometimes you can see people on the images and sometimes just, just buildings. And, and with this description, it's just, it's just Google Earth, except that it was 10 years before Google Earth. You couldn't have it at home on your computer. And, and I think that the design of TerraVision was, was way cooler, but so I'd say this is the first role of artists is that they are not forecaster, they're not writing science fiction, but by paying attention to some of their work, you can really get a glimpse of what tomorrow could bring. 
Um, if I have to be fair, I'd say that uh, there are other projects that really uh, give an idea of what Google Earth would, would bring. And I'd just like to mention this other one, which is from the 80s, and it's by a guy called um, Michael Neymar, and he made this Golden Gate flyover, and this time it's just limited, it's just around the Bay Area. And uh, it's not satellite images, there was images he took with, uh, with a camera from, from a helicopter. But it was the same, you could navigate and, and zoom. Um, across the surface. Um, another very quick example uh, that I'll take this time from, from the 60s. They were not really new media artists, they were just a group of avant-garde architects and they were called um, Archi Archigram. They were active in the 60s and early 70s and they were more like dominating the avant-garde of architecture. They didn't really build anything. I, get, I think they built a playground, uh, an exhibition and a swimming pool for Rod Stewart, um, if you know that singer. Um, and what they imagined was the walking city. So Ron et Ron, which was one of the Archigram guys, imagined this city which would I mean people would hop into, into the, the walking city and, and go from, from one place to the other. If they are bored with the place, they would just go to another. If they have exhausted the energy resources, they would just um, step into the walking city and go to, to another place location. Um, it's more complicated than that, but that was one of the, the features of the walking city. And now, um, I think it's really, really similar to this project, um, which dates back to last year. There was a competition in the UK asking studios of, of, of architects to come up with ideas for new, the new Antarctic surveys, so where the rich researcher uh, would uh, research. Uh, about um, the environment in, uh, in Antarctic, and the winning project is this one. So it's, it's a kind of city. It's where the, the, there's the laboratory, there's the place where the researchers are sleeping, eating, um, relaxing, and doing basically everything. And um, it's in the Antarctic, and it would sit on a, on a thick uh, level of ice. And um, it doesn't exactly work. It has... Uh, long legs and it's built on, on ski, the kind of, I don't know if you see it very well, uh, it's not feet but, but kind of ski. So what happens if they, when the researcher, the scientist detects that the level of ice that the station is uh, standing on is getting too thin or too fragile or, or they, they, they risk to drift into the ocean on an iceberg, they are just pushed, they, 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 they get a bulldozer and they are just pushed to another location. And, and I'm sure, I mean, Archigram have influenced many, many uh, architects over the decades think about the biggest architects and most of them will say, yeah, we've been influenced by, by Archigram. And I think this is a clear um, indication, a clear example. So that was the first rule, I'd say, of artists, which, which to give uh, an idea of what tomorrow could bring. Another, um, another role they play, which is very important to me, is that um, they just um, make technology funnier and more engaging. And, and for someone like me, uh, I'm, I don't have a background in technology and I'm still quite intimidated by technology. And the fact that they, they, they give it more appeal and, and bring it to me and, and sometimes bring a smile on, on the face of people who are kind of afraid of technology, I think it's very important. So just one example, uh, it's called Net Cuckoo. It's, it's, project from 2001, and these two Spanish designers, they made this, uh, it's a cuckoo clock, except that it doesn't give the time. Every 15 minutes, it just displays uh, the headlines from, from newspaper. And there's something else, there's a switch. And if, you, if you're someone who has um, from the uh, sympathies from, from the um, political party from, from the left, you would just uh, put the switch to the left and you would have the, the headlines from newspaper from, from the left wing and the contrary if you, if you have um, sympathies for, for uh, political parties from, from the right. He, he made eight examples, uh, they made eight objects like this. Uh, which really comment on one, you, you could take it on, on two ways. One, on the fact that many people are still, um, they would still really be interested in, in surfing the net and getting news about anything that, uh, about their obsession. It can be uh, star gossips, it can be the headlines, it can be porn or, or anything. And, but they're just still, just still afraid of, of internet, of computer, and just very easy. Um, 
to handle, they're just easy to handle uh, objects, they are not threatening, they are objects they would find in your kitchen. And this other one is just, is just a book where you can, you can see webcam from the designer, call, it, call them vivacious ladies. Um, but the third role of, of artists, uh, which is probably the most, the most crucial, is that uh, they have a critical eye on, on society and on, on society in, in general, and on the way we use and we see uh, technology. Um, so I will give uh, several examples, and that's when I'm, I'm going to talk about trust. So first, the first project I'm going to talk about is um, uh, when these new media artists are, are having a critical eye on, on the contemporary art itself. With, um, with this artist called um, Derko Maver. Derko Maver was a Serbian um, sculptor. Uh, and he became famous in 1998. He was walking around uh, ex-Yugoslavia and um, living sculpture in hotel rooms, in empty houses, toilets, along the road, in in, this is the kind of sculpture he was doing, like the dummies, which um, imitated dead bodies or fetus, or, or really um, bodies having, um, uh, having had to suffer the atrocities of, of the Balkan Wars. Um, very quickly he got arrested because, yeah, it wasn't um, uh, very patriotic what he was showing, so all his dummies have been destroyed. And the art community in, in the rest of, of, the, of Europe, especially in Italy, got very interested and they started um, uh, campaigning and talking about the freedom of art and trying to, to organize, they organize exhibition and, um, and, and wrote about it in magazine and critics started to try to interpret the, wor the work of the artist. And really the top of it was in, in 1999, uh, the, a documentary about his work was shown uh, at the Venice Biennale. So I don't know if everybody knows the Venice Biennale. It's one, it's really the top in in, um, in in the art world. It's uh, traditional. It's one one of the uh, the oldest art biennale and of of contemporary art. So the problem is that it was a fake. Uh, the artist never existed at all. So just after the art biennale, the the artist who um, we totally created the, the personality of this, of this artist and, and his work. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce their name, it's this vortex of zero and one over there. And they just said, yeah, it doesn't exist, there's no dummies at all, we just found the, the images, there are real images of the atrocities of war, they were, they were um, on the internet, and what, what we want to say is just that we want to show the mechanism of, of contemporary art, and it's like, you know, they're not the first who do that. I mean, Duchamp uh, did it with his, with his urinoir, and they just want to go to take the example of Marcel, du Marcel Duchamp and go to the extreme. There's no urinoir, there's no object at all. There's something immaterial. There's just images on, on the internet. And in one year, they went from zero, from something inexistent to the v Venice Biennale. So that's the first example, and it's getting even more interesting when these artists, uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, another kind of artist, um, uh, try to make us reflect about, about society in general. Um, this first example is from um, a, Dutch, a Dutch woman. She's a photographer, a performer. She's called um, Nicoline van der Kemp. And she, during several years, she really explored the world of public and private security guard and police forces and very documented the way they dress, etc. And she made, she made several performances in several cities, um, and one was in, in, um, in Istanbul. She just found two actors. Um, she gave them fake identities and a uniform with logos, stuff like that that she, that she bought uh, on a shopping mall, and say, yeah, just go in the street and do nothing. And very quickly, the people, these two guys, they, they kind of uh, met other, guy, other guards or people from the police. They were shaking hands and they were like, suddenly they became colleagues. Um, 
People were asking direction, um, asking them to help because uh, someone has stolen a, pur a purse, or, or they even, man they, they even um, maneuver a, a boat for tourists. They, they made tons of things during just 12 years, and, and in 12 hours, and in 12 hours they just overtook a number of, of different rules and everybody accepted them like people ha having a kind of, of power and, and authority and nobody questioned it. And, and like they had no, I mean, they had no official logo. It was just fake, fake logos they were wearing. So I'm not sure you can read, but uh, the artist made a video and, and so the, the, the actor explained what happened to them. And this one said, somebody said, I know judo and karate. Can I get a job with your company? The other one, um, the guard saying, I don't think that they cared very much who we were. It was funny, but also quite sad. So that was in Istanbul, and you could think, yeah, it's far away, but they did, uh, I mean, the artist did the same kind of performance in other city, uh, in, uh, in Glasgow, in Rotterdam, in Amsterdam, and this is in, in, um, in London, and exactly the same. She, the guy got, is an actor, he just got, um, uh, this very bright vest and a clip-on um, tie and yeah, stuff like that and, and immediately he was befriended by, by other guards and, and given responsibilities and the problem is that there's no very clear um, uh, jurisdiction and, and these guards, uh, very, I mean many of them don't have any more power or more rights than, than, than you and me. So. And I'm not going to talk about this one. Um, <laughs> because it's long. Um, <clears throat> okay, sorry. <clears throat> so that was an example. I went, I, I started with the artists criticizing the, the art and the way our society accepts and trusts anyone without, without asking any question. And, and the last part will be about how artists are... Um, exploring technology, the way we use it, and, and the danger we can, we can encounter. And I will show um, several strategies they propose and several projects they have imagined for us to regain some, some kind of, of power over it. So the first project um, is, um, is a series of performances by someone called Michel Terran. And for several years she goes from city to city and um, she discovered, yeah, she, she bought like one of these devices and it's, it's very common, it's quite cheap and it's a frequency scanner and uh, with it she just goes in the street uh, in this performance she was dressed as a Trump and she had TV monitor in it and she can, she can really um, detect and, and grab the images of private security cameras so we're not talking about institutional security camera but about <clears throat> public one, like, like uh, the, the, the reception of a hotel or, or a money teller, um, but also private one um, from places that people want to keep private and, and secret and to themselves, like um, a baby in a crib, so she, she could also, she also detected um, images of unmade beds, stuff like that that she um, immediately broadcast on, on her on her TV monitors so that people, everyone in the streets can see them. It's still her again in, in another location and this time the, the monitors are embedded in a, in a suitcase. So everywhere she, she goes, she kind of adapts a bit the, the performance. And it's just, I mean, it's not new that people are, there's really an increase in surveillance, uh, but it's, I mean, what she, she's pointing at is that it's the extent of it. Uh, like, everybody now is a kind of mini broadcaster and have images. They, they think they could keep private, but um, I mean, the waves are going through the walls and you can get the images of, of private places and, and suddenly brought it, brought it on, on the outside. Um, when I'm talking about artists dealing with technology, I'm not just talking about you know, the technology, the first kind of technology you think about, which would be computers and, and mobile phones, but other kinds of so-called emerging technologies like nanotechnology or, um, or biotechnology. Um, this, this example, I, I don't know if it's quite famous if, in, if you're into bioart, etc. It's by a group called... Um, Tissue, tissue culture and art project, and they, they, uh, 
uh, they are uh, investigating the concept of, of semi-living um, creature and, and doing things, food and clothes, without hurting any animals, without, without killing anyone. So what they did, they just they were they are just growing uh, they were just growing in a, in a kind of bioreactor, a tiny jacket, which is kind of living. What they what they did, they took um, cells from from mouses from mouse and and cells uh, bone cell from human. They put them together. They they grow them on on polymer and um, inside the bioreactor in the shape of a of a jacket. So there's a better view. And um, they show that they show that that around, and it seems that people are more disturbed by the fact that maybe one day they could they could wear something like that. I mean, it's very small; it could only fit a, a mouse. It's, it's small like that. But <clears throat> some people would rather wear the um, the skin of a dead animal and not not be concerned about what could have happened to that, that animal, rather than 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 wear this. So, on the one hand, is is um, a critic of the way we handle animals, but on the other hand, it's like this semi-living um, human being. How how could we, how should we um, deal with them? Uh, are they living? They, yes, they are living, but they don't have a brain. So how how could we discard them? So they are really raising a series of questions, and I think it's uh, what they do, especially in biotechnology, is very important because when you think about biotechnology and you read the newspaper and. Uh, there are some kind of quite spectacular stories about what they're doing in the laboratories, and uh, I like to read them. It's so far away from my everyday life. And when you have um, an example like that, suddenly biotechnology becomes tangible, something that you could identify with, that could, that could come in your, in, your, in your life, in your, in your wardrobe in this case, and, and hopefully the people can start thinking about it and having discussion, and, and maybe if they have discussion, and if, if they figure that the kind of future um, that they can envision is, is not the one they, they expect or the one they want, maybe they could change things and, and contact um, people in laboratories or in the government because technology is something that happens to us. I mean, technologies are developed in laboratories and, and when we, they, they come into our life, it's too late. They are there and we cannot change anything. So I will just read this because he said it much better than I could. Um, one of the guys who developed one of these projects said, artists should engage in biological related technologies as a medium of suggestion for alternative and contestable futures, and even more importantly, to inform and try to generate a public dia dialogue regarding the possibilities of these technologies. The artist should adopt a visionary model by preparing society for the greater, cha greater challenges ahead in the fields of biotechnology. I just give a last example of this this uh, this group in uh, se several years ago. Um, it was still the concept of of having uh, animals not suffering. They had um, uh, an experiment which was called disembodied uh, cuisine. So they were in France, which is the paradise, the motherland of nouvelle cuisine. And what they did was uh, perform a biopsy on a, on a frog and take cell from the frog and just grow in the lab in front of everyone. They could visit it and grow it in into stacks, very small stacks. Like you can see the kind of stacks they, they get and feed it to the people and, and show in the laboratory the frog still living. And, and this time, it's, again, it's like, yeah, we, we are eating more and more modify, modified uh, food, and this time they put it in front of everybody. Like during several days, people could, could come, uh, the laboratories was, was, was public, and people could see the kind of modification uh, the food was, was, they might eat was undergoing. And, um, yeah, it's also once again about about um, about uh, cruelty, about animals, and about something else more important that I forgot. That's very bad. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll come back. Oh, that's bad. Um, a last example. I mean, uh, these two two projects I showed by uh, Tissue Culture and Art Project. These, these are, I would say, very clever and and quite lucky guys because they managed to to uh, collaborate with a research center in, in Australia. But when you deal with biotechnology, it's something expensive. 
It's something uh, which is quite dangerous. I mean, some artists have been accused of bi bioterrorism and went to prison because they were, they were playing with biotechnology. And yeah, and, and very often it's still in the laboratory, so when you cannot uh, uh, collaborate with, with researchers and, and establish laboratories, what you can do is just create a totally fake project with videos and, and kind of imagine the future with, uh, with these um, biotechnologies. And um, there's someone, I mean, it's a couple I like really, really a lot. They are called um, Anthony Dunn and Fiona Habi, and uh, they are teaching at the Royal College of Art in, in London. And that's what they are doing now. They are really trying to have students engage with, with um, biotechnology and nanotechnology, even nanotechnology is still a bit difficult. And one of the projects, uh, one of the students um, came up with is Memento Mori in vitro. So the inspiration is that during the Victorian era, uh, people will wear um, some, some air into, into um, a pendant, uh, how do you call it, a necklace? A locket, inside a locket. And so he get this inspiration and he thought, yeah, if that, in, during the Victorian area, a person who's dead or is very far away is kept kind of alive into the locket through, through the air. So let's imagine what, what it could be in the era of biotechnology. So imagine that um, that per person who's remote or who's dead, uh, some hair from, from that person would be taken and, and put in a, in a growing um, component. So you would live with that, that dead person or that person was living far away. And every morning when you have breakfast, you would just feed the, this, um, this air. Uh, you will have to wash them very regularly because they are still growing and still living. And uh, when you're watching TV, you can stroke them. That's like what you do with a lover. Uh, you know, have, he has his head on your, on your knees and you just stroke her hair. So I think it's absolutely disgusting, but some, some, some people think it's, it's, it's quite nice. And it's a kind of real... It's, the, it, the, I mean, this student he invented the notion of romanticism in the, in the age of biotechnology. And, and maybe within 10 years, I will, I will not think that it's disgusting. I will be, I don't know. But anyway, the most important thing is, is that when I first heard about this project, I was, I was quite horrified. And, um, and, I, and I kept this project in my head during weeks, and I, and I started thinking about it. And, and yeah, some people might be, might be very pleased to be able to do that. So it really, um, as I said, it really made me think about technology, that just technology is not a series of applications, it's also a series of implications, of consequences. They can be social, they can be ethical, or they can be cultural, or they can even be political. Um, yeah, how many examples do I have? Um, I think it gets, it gets more interesting when, when these artists are not just pointing to the problems and saying, hey, wake up, there's something there, you, you have to, to be aware of it. But when they, it gets even more interesting when they, they give us some tools to, to change uh, something. Um, the first example is called tra Tracking the Torture Taxi. Um, maybe you know that um, uh, there are some people who are suspected, suspected of, of terrorism. And so the CIA, CIA, the US CIA, kidnap them, put them on a plane, and, and fly them to, to other countries everywhere in the world. It's called extraordinary rendition. Like there's no proof that this person are terrorists. There are, there are questions in their, they are sent in camps. There are questions. Um, probably they are also tortured. And for several years, there are a group of amateurs who are called, they call them plane spotters. And they just, they just document what, what happens. Most of this plane, um, I mean, the CIA has to cover this, this activity. So most of these planes are, are commercial planes. And they belong to uh, fake companies, companies that do not exist, or individuals, I mean, just names, but there's no one existing behind them. So uh, they're op op operated by the CIA, but they are, they are commercial. And so what these, uh, these plane spotters are doing, they are just trying to take pictures from far away and document exactly uh, when the plane takes off, uh, when it arrives and where, etc. And um, Trevor Paglen, 
uh, got interested in this uh, in these stories very very quickly. So he defines himself as an expert in uh, military secrecy. And uh, with another, with a journalist, a more investigative journalist, um, he started ra raising awareness about it. I mean, it's something that it exists. I mean, even Bush um, in September, in early September, declared, yeah, we, we do that, but we still don't know to what extent it exists. Uh, all we know is that... Um, it's the biggest operation since the, um, the end of the Cold Air era, and it's getting bigger and bigger, really out of proportion. Um, so he wrote a book, he makes exhibition. Uh, thank God, not just in art uh, galleries, but also in, uh, in universities and, and other public sp places. And uh, he documents his funding. For example, he has um, contacts inside the army who send them um, logos that uh, these officials who are working in, in secret, on secret missions have to, to wear. I mean, um, people in the army, they have to wear logos that identify them, that identify their place in the hierarchy and their achievement. But if you're working on a secret mission, how do you represent something that shouldn't be represented? So Trevor just uh, is collecting several of these, these logos, and they are, they are quite real. They, they look like uh, something coming, coming from, from cults or, or esoteric organizations or so, stuff like that. But one of his projects he's working on, which I think is... I find it absolutely fantastic. It's called Terminal Air. So I, I thought about this uh, plane spotter while documenting uh, the movement of these planes. And, and, and they put it online, but on several websites. And each time they find a document, they could add, they put them on their website. And what Terminal Air is doing is just putting together and gathering all these documents. So you have a single interface, and you can follow in real time what's happening. And even more than that, if you're a registered user, um, you can get an SMS to, be, uh, to know when the plane is coming in your, in your city or in your country or in your area. So, so you can grab your, uh, your digital phone cam uh, camera or your mobile uh, phone with a camera and go and take pictures and, and post them. And it's, I mean, it's a tool to, to inform people and it has similar, it's working on similar installation that is going to show around. Um, I don't know how much time I still have. Okay. Um, um, this one is more about about media, and it's it's another example of of artists trying to empower us. And in, in this case, with this tactical ice cream unit, um, it's a comment on the fact that. Um, many sources of information or the way we communicate, there's some financial process we have to pay somewhere or another and we, we don't really have the control about what's, what's being broadcasted or, or anything. So this, this big truck um, is divided in two, so there's the, the mother truck and inside there's a small... Um, a small card for ice cream, and inside inside the bit card there's um, everything for for activists like there's um, uh, GPS technology, satellite um, surveillance camera, and and they just they just arrive in a city and they meet uh, activists, uh, local activists, and they say yeah we are here and just use uh, use us use our facilities. We have I mean they have anything uh, balloons, masks. So if people want to to document um, corporate dumping or, or police behaving badly, or if they want to organize a process a protest. Um, or monitor any other thing. Uh, these guys are there, and they, they, they provide uh, people with uh, with the tools they really need to have uh, an effective uh, protest, for example. And, um, and yeah, there's the, so there's the tactical ice cream card, which is more mobile and distributes real ice ice cream for free, but also document to to make people think and inform them about about uh, potential uh, activist um, events in the area. Uh, this one is... Uh, I'm too tired for that one. Okay. 
uh, I think this is the last example. It's um, still another example of, of trying to get, to get some control and not having the information mediated by anyone and, and by anyone else or by, by, um, by government or anything. And this one is about environment. Um, it's very difficult to know exactly the level of pollution of a, of a city. No, it's, it's easy to get it, but how do you know it's really accurate and, and correct, and how precise can it be? So, uh, Miriam Milicevic, imagine uh, uh, what she called neighborhood satellites, and it's a kind of, of, of game. She did it what she was studying, with, uh, and she built it with, with crap, uh, things she, that, that was dumped in her school. And so you have a, a game, a um, little display, and, uh, and a device, and, and all the t technology is hidden in the backpack. And what you do, there are three modes of, of um, checking which kind of environment or pollutant there's in, in, um, in your neighborhood. Um, you, can, you can play with, your, with the, this is the little satellite, and with it uh, you can, uh, uh, I mean, it detects, um, the level of light, um, how much um, phone signal there is, and, and several uh, data about uh, the existing pollution. And, and you can see it on, on the display. This is your satellite, uh, this little bird, and these are the kind of pollution around you. Uh, pollution or, or places of green or... Um, non-polluted area. So the idea is that you can either uh, go around in your neighborhood and, and exactly see how polluted it is. You can play also with it. So there's, it's, it's, in fact, it's also a game. So uh, your little satellite can be attacked by pollutant. And um, yeah, so it's a game. And, and there's something hidden be behind it. What happens when, when you, you become a good player, you want to pass to the next level, and the next level will be going to a um, very polluted area. But do you want to do that to your health? So it's just just kind of uh, trigger some, some, a series of questions in the mind of the gamer. And the most um, interesting mode to play it is playing uh, with the community, with other people in your neighborhood and, and just sharing information and mapping exactly in your neighborhood where is the pollution. And, and use it as a tool. It can be using, used like several people in a crossing uh, playing silently and it would be a kind of silent protest against... against um, the pollution, but it could, it could also mean some very um, basic things, like you want, you want to rent or you want to, to buy your house, and, and you, can, you could bargain the, pr the price of the, of the house. I mean, it would be a, a, new, a new kind of, of characteristic. Uh, and you say, oh, I'm sorry, this house is too polluted, so, so I, I can say to, to any, anyone, so please uh, decrease the, the price. So that's just an example of, of what... Uh, one can do with this kind of, of um, project. Um, yeah, I will come to that one after that. I'm not sure that my talk um, really helped you uh, if you want to answer the question, who can we trust? But what I wanted to show is that uh, there, there's one thing we can be sure of, is that the artists will just try to provide a tool or upon your attention to to the kind of people you, you shouldn't trust, even if they, they look trustworthy, and, um, and um, sometimes even provide you the tool to regain some, some power of a series of, of issues. And um, before, before finishing, um, I don't know if everybody has seen this project. It's, it's downstairs, and I'm not sure uh, it's well explained uh, what it is exactly. So I thought I would just and by explaining very quickly what it is. It's, um, it's a project that's been developed. Uh, is, is Marcus Kirson here? Do you want to come and explain your project? I should, I should have... I, I was thinking about asking you and finding you, and, and then I forgot. Do you mind? Um, Hang on, I also have the website, so you can... I wanted to show um, the video you put online, so I will just... While you talk, if, it's, if that's okay, otherwise, if you want other images. While you talk, I will just show the video.
Tu on lihtsa? Should we, ah, perfect. Okay. So this perfect was developed at the Uni University of the Arts in Berlin in the digital media class of Professor Sauter. And it's um, a live webcam installation. So now you see the installation when it's not, uh, um, the projector is not online. And you have four models which are from the left to right in Denmark and in Amsterdam a laundromat and the next one is my own inner courtyard in Berlin and the last one is in Vermont. And these models were printed on a 3D plotter from rapid, rapid prototyping. So now you see the installation when it's uh, on. So here you see the first installation in Denmark. You have, uh, it's a found footage installation with four live webcam streams which are transformed to uh, live miniatures. So here you see uh, street crossing anywhere in Denmark. Next one is on the laundromat in Amsterdam. So these models were printed on a, uh, were printed on a rapid prototyping system, which uh, uh, hardens sand, uh, slice by slice, to create these models. And the third one is my own inner courtyard. It's the next one. Okay, it's the left one. And um, it works with kind of a split screen, so there's one projector in the middle, and you have those models in a half circle around you, and the projector goes to the front, and there are four mirrors which divide the light, and then the light comes back to the four models, so you only need one mirror which is kind of effective because you know, projectors are very expensive. <laughs> so this is the last model and this model is very nice because you have um, a timeline in the top of the picture and you see that it's really live because the time is always running when you look at it. And on Friday, that's cool because uh, on Friday there's a market so you can have a look at the market on the model and when it's getting dark it's getting like this. So you see the lights in the, in the windows. Okay, it's about three or four minutes um, transition from here to there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, one last, last thing. Um, and oh, I'm not very good at, at putting my screen uh, like I should. Is that while I was preparing this talk, um, Oh, shit. You see, and, uh, you see Angus Leva, whom some of you know, and Katharina Becker, and Marlene Keimerer, I hope I pronounced her name well. We uh, worked on a blog. Um, the address is mediaart.ccc.de, and, and tonight I will put online all the address of the project I talk about. And if you, if you go on the website, there are, there are several projects I didn't talk about. They were more about surveillance, and, and the one on the top is, is the pro project of, of Marcus. So it was a kind of of having an online exhibition which, would, which was targeted to, to, to this Congress. And, and that's it. So if you have questions or comments. Okay, if there are no questions, then uh, thank you for attending the talk and thank you very much, Regine Depatie.